and that brings us to the final session of today. Um, and this presentation, which is going to be on the rise of China and the way that um, China's political and economic rise is influencing the entire global outlook, is going to be given by Robert Ward. Uh, Robert Ward is the country publishing director at the Economist Intelligence Unit. He's been in the business for a long time, almost as long as I have. Um, his background is an Asian analyst. Um, he was a senior analyst within our Asian team, specialising in a number of different countries around this part of the world. And now he looks after all of our country publishing. Um, he's an excellent presenter, and I hope that you have an enjoyable 30 minutes um, learning about the rise of China. Robert. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, Clicker is here. Excellent. Um, I first came to uh, Asia in the 1980s when Japan was the future. So that's a long time ago. In those days when Japan, when growth in Japan was less than 3%, it was a recession. So just how much can change in such a short space of time? And of course, that also applies to China, where lots of things have been changing in a very, very short space of time. Um, crises, they really do accelerate existing trends. They really do, and nowhere has that been more the case, I think, than with Asia. China, of course, is, is in, in many cases, is shorthand for China when I say Asia, than, than Asia's rise to uh, preeminence in the global economy, the shift of the global center of gravity to Asia. We've had global decoupling, recoupling, first time coupling. It sounds like I'm channeling the Kama Sutra, but actually I'm talking about the shift, very, very important. This is the reconnection of countries within the world towards Asia again. I'm gonna try and talk about China's rise. I'm gonna reference some of, the, some of the issues that we've been talking about, talk about the impact, talk about the intellectual impact, and try and give a few pointers as to how China might uh, capitalize on its, uh, on its rise to preeminence. This is one of my favorite slides, actually, because it shows you what the world looks like in 2020 in terms of the size of the global economies. And the first thing that you will notice about this is that the UK is larger than France. Obviously, I'm more impressed about, by this than you are. The other thing you'll notice, of course, is that, uh, that China is number one. And it will become number one, we think, in about 2020. Um, when it does become number one, there's going to be lots of sort of outpouring of grief in, in Western newspapers, just as there were in Japan when China overtook Japan. But as I'll show you in the next slide, there are issues with China as number one. Also, what you'll notice is this is an Asian an Asian century. If you look in the top 12, there are about five countries there. Yes, I've cheated with ASEAN, but in 2029, Indonesia will be in the top 10. So really an Asian century. But what, why is China having difficulties? Well, this is a little aside here. China's rise is, has been quite unique in terms of the speed, in terms of the size of China. But also, this is the first time that a middle-income country has been number one. No country has been so old and so poor at the same time. We haven't really talked much about demography today, but look at this chart. You can see that in terms of wealth, China is where Japan was in the 1960s. In terms of its, demo in terms of its demography, it's where Japan was in the 1970s. So really, China risks getting old before it gets rich, but at least you're not the Russians where you'll die before you get old. So, you know, let's get things in perspective. The economic impact of this, well, as we've been talking, and this sort of reprises some of the things we've been talking about, China is now an exporter of jobs to Asia. How much has changed over the past 10 years when the ASEAN countries, for example, 10 years ago, were worried that they would lose their FDI to China? Now China is an FDI investor in the region, and as Robin said, in 2017, it will be a net outbound investor, just in 10 short years. What you see here, of course, is that China on the right there is, is getting expensive. It's getting pricey, and you're seeing, low, you're seeing lower value-added stuff being shed to countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, and so on. But not just to Asia, but as Pat showed us, 
also to Africa, the Ethiopian shoe story. I don't have any Chinese Ethiopian made shoes yet, but I may do, and when I do, that may be another transition point for China. So what you see here is that China is really changing the economic relationships within the world as a result of its economic rise. This is a little aside here in terms of China's construction industry, which we think is actually the most important single sector in the world. So do watch it if you want to get an idea of global, uh, of, of global economic performance. And we found out that China has enough constructive capacity to build a city the size of Rome every two weeks. Extraordinary. It can build Spain in a year, and it can build Europe in 15 years. So this is a very, very important sector for you to be watching. And also, again, to pick up what Pat was saying, what you're seeing as a result of this sort of extension of Chinese economic power is a rise in South-South trade. Last year, very interesting this, last year was the first year in which emerging market to emerging market trade in, in value terms overtook emerging market to developed country trade. Look at that light blue line. That is really rising fast. This reflects, again, the impact of China. If you strip out Japan and Korea and Taiwan, you see intra-regional trade also rising very fast indeed. So the world increasingly is really China-centric. It is sort of recoupling, as I said earlier, towards China, decoupling from the West, very important for the global economy. Let's think about the intellectual impact here. And this is very interesting because creditor nations, historically, creditor nations have really set the tone for the global economic debate. And that was the case after the Second World War with, with Bretton Woods, of course, and the United States. Look here at the wealth that is piling up in China, in Asia, in China particularly. This is foreign exchange reserves. Really, this is where the wealth, the global wealth, is really residing at the moment. So my guess would be that the next system that eventually replaces Bretton Woods will have an Asian name, and it may even have a Chinese name. This is a unique opportunity for the region to start to set the intellectual trends for the global economy going forward. Unfortunately, as Robin showed at the beginning, the Eurozone is really out for the count. This is a real shame because I think the Eurozone does have a, a great role to play in terms of rules-based governance. The Eurozone crisis, we think it, the Eurozone will survive, but the crisis is going from acute to chronic. And chronic is great if you've been an, in an acute situation, but unfortunately Europe will be inward-looking and also the US has great political issues, and I don't think the US is going to be really setting the global trend. So a unique once-in-a-generation opportunity for China to start setting the global trend. And just to extend this theme, if we're thinking of state capitalism, the rise of state capitalism here, you can see this is the top 10 global countries with sovereign wealth funds, and you can see, no surprise, China is number one, over a trillion dollars of wealth in the Chinese sovereign wealth funds. And no surprise again, Asia, if you include Aust Australia, I think has about four countries in the top 10. These sovereign wealth funds, state capitalism, SOEs, call them what you will, they can really change the face of global industry, the face of global finance. You're already seeing some sovereign wealth funds linking up with other sovereign wealth funds and bypassing the traditional centers of finance such as London and New York and so on. And again, China can really play a key role here. The politics. This is where the discussion gets a little bit more difficult because China has the economic hardware, but now to really capitalize on this, you need the software. And that, of course, is politics. And although China is, is preeminent in Asia, there is real competition for who leads in Asia. Asia is also fragmented, as Pat pointed out earlier. These are all the areas in, for which there, is, there are, there are uh, geo, geographical flashpoints. Look, a necklace of troubles around China. And this, of course, is sometimes why China feels hemmed in, but it is also why it is really important now for China to grab, to, to fine-tune, if you like, its, uh, its politics. Japan, 
Mr. Abe, Abenomics. Do you know Abenomics? Abenomics. Shinzo Abe, it's a, little, it's a little new word that they're using in Japan. Abe for the Prime Minister, Abe. And nomics for economics, so Abenomics. So he's great experiment in, in monetary policy. This gives me a chance to tell you a Japanese joke. Do you want to hear a Japanese joke? You do? Excellent. I can't guarantee whether you'll find it funny, though. But anyway, I'm going to tell it. And in March, we were in Tokyo, and we were talking about Abenomics. And there is relevance here to China, of course. We were talking about Abenomics, and there was a very feisty Japanese uh, academic. And she said, this is the joke. She, you're laughing already. I haven't told the punchline yet. She said, it's not Abenomics. It's Ahonomics. OK. Let's roll back. That was the punchline, by the way. It's late, so you, you've been to a lot of content. It, very interesting for me, this, this point here. I have another joke, which is a German economist's joke, which is even less funny, so I will spare you that. Aho in Japanese, aho, A-H-O, means stupid. So here you have, very interesting for me as a follower of Japan, you have a very senior person saying, this is a bad policy. This experiment with, with monetary policy, fiscal policy, it's bad. So even within Japan, there is a lot of conflict about Abenomics. But the interesting point for you here in China is that this really is not just an attempt to revitalize Japan from the inside. It's also an attempt to reposition Japan's leadership within Asia. So do look at this, because even though Japan is going to be number three, as we saw in 2020, you do have competition again from Japan. If you go down south, we were in, we were in ASEAN last week. ASEAN, the ASEAN Economic Community in 2015, they wanted, they wanted to kick off. This is also an attempt, in my view, to limit Chinese power in the region. So of course, China, the soft the soft bit of Chinese policy now is so important. And whether China gets this right or wrong will really determine how effectively the Chinese government is able, and Chinese companies as well, are able to really capitalize on what I've been showing you before. And then just the final points here in my presentation. You can see now it's really all about the fine tuning, the software, formulate a clear idea about what constitutes Chinese national interest. Sometimes looking from outside, it's not clear. And often, strikingly, Chinese national interests actually dovetail very well with US national interest. Uh, open trade, all these kind of things. Also, try to fine tune the government, a bigger role for the foreign ministry. This is very important. We want policy to be coordinated. At the moment, it's split between the army, the president, the prime minister, the foreign ministry. That needs to change. You need to speak with one voice in terms of, in terms of policy. And also, with the multilateral institutions, you need a far bigger role, because China will be number one in 2020, as we've seen. There's absolutely no reason why the Americans and the Europeans should still dominate. So really fight for that. And finally, I think a real touchstone of Chinese reform attitude will be the attitude to the renminbi. For me, this is a benchmark for the Chinese government's attitude towards broader economic policy reform. But of course, the renminbi is also seen as a political tool by the government, makes it very difficult to do anything drastic about it. But until this is done, in my view, China will fail to take its real position uh, within the global economy. The economy does need to be more open. Well, with that, um, I think we've got about 10 minutes for questions now. Um, that concludes. Happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions? Perhaps you want to hear my German economist joke. No, we're going to have a question. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you for the presentation. My name is Jason from Honeywell. Uh, on your last point, you mentioned RMB uh, deregulation. Uh, Many people are speculating it's going to happen within the next five years. What is, what is your view and what do you think is going to get us there? What are some of the leading indicators that will show us that RMB is going to deregulate? 
Do you mean complete deregulation, so the capital account flow, is complete open? Flow, complete flow. I think that's too soon. They are deregulating at the margins, so you're seeing London is, is going to become a, or is trying to become a renminbi uh, transaction centre. You have um, some activity in Hong Kong as well, of course. But the key point here is that the renminbi, in my view, for the Chinese government, is also a political tool. It allows the government to keep the world out and a bit more sort of control over the economy. This, however, in my view, is not compatible with a deepening of financial markets, so allowing consumers greater access to more sophisticated uh, financial products. At the moment, why does China have a housing bubble? Because there's nothing else to invest in if you're a consumer with savings within China. That needs to change. Now, I would say five years is too soon. I would say we're looking more at uh, 10 to 15 years, and this will be a kind of gradual a gradual process. Uh, so far, the government has managed it relatively well, trying to stay ahead of the speculators and so on. But it is a very, I suppose, tense time for the government, because when you give up this, this control, you really can't get it back. So I would say 10 to 15 years, and absolutely no way that the renminbi can become a world reserve currency until this happens. So anyone that tells you otherwise, I don't know what they're smoking, but it has to be freely Freely, freely tradable. Thank you. Robin, an, an easy one, please. No, it's, <laughs> it's a really hard one, actually. Um, I talked a little bit earlier on about China dreaming. Um, so that's the current policy stance of the, the regime. Um, previous policy stances included peaceful rise. Um, and your presentation includes, in almost every sphere, economic, geopolitical, China rising to the top of the tree. Um, and the assumption, I think, embedded within it, as this happens in a relatively smooth manner, notwithstanding your, your slide of all the flashpoints. But historically, um, while not unprecedented, that's not been the way that things have normally gone. So I just wonder why you feel China can pull off this peaceful rise, um, because in, in the past we've seen that other nations have found that difficult to do. Well, I don't think it is pulling off a peaceful rise. Um, the harmonious rise was all very well, but when you have an unsatisfied power coming through into the global economy, um, you're going to get disruption, you're going to get encroaching into other countries' uh, spheres of influence and so on. So this is, I think, the, the idea of a harmonious rise is fine in theory, but actually in practice um, it's something that, uh, that is very difficult to pull off. The China dream, what a fantastic idea, marketing that idea that is. That is great because it means absolutely nothing or it means absolutely everything depending on what you want it to mean. So this is, I think, is, is directed more, the China dream is directed more internally than the harmonious rise was. Um, I don't think China's rise can be uh, entirely harmonious because as a very rapidly growing important power, of course, China wants to, um, wants to exercise this power. This is absolutely natural. Um, every country that has grown quickly, the United States, some of the others, they've all done this, and they have, they have new, spheres of of new spheres of interest that they want to capitalize on. So I think that China's rise to date has been relatively smooth, but if you look at Asia, all the flashpoints there, you look at um, what's going on in Japan, and Mr. Abe, the interesting thing about him is he is one of the first of Japan's prime ministers to see his role in terms of national destiny and you have a new leadership in China, there are plenty of uh, opportunities, I suppose, for things to go wrong. And this is a region which has many nuclear powers, uh, has many territorial disputes, uh, and is very um, tense at, at the best of times. So I don't think China has pulled off an entirely harmonious rise. Uh, and going forward, actually, I think even more difficult. Because if you, if you think about policy, the Chinese government, what it has to do in terms of policy is actually the most difficult policy decisions that I think have had to be taken since Deng, since Deng Xiaoping opened the economy in 1978. This is all fine-tuning soft stuff, and it's very difficult to do. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, this question might be of speculative nature. You mentioned building so, built soft power here. A uh, Harvard professor called Joseph Nye have argued, unless China built soft power comparable to the US, 
it will not become a major power in the world. So do you think China can build its soft power within the near, reasonable near future? And if not, to what extent do you think China's rise will reach or what kind of role China will play? If the final destination. I suspect that what, you're, what that chap said is, is right. And this soft power is one reason why you should never write the US off, despite all its problems. The US has tremendous soft power, partly related to its diaspora. It's so multi multicultural. It's embedded in every single part of the world. It's innovative, all these things. Tremendous soft power. China has the hardware. The economic hardware is all there. I mean, it's spectacular. The rise really is spectacular, unique, fantastic. But without the soft power, China will not realize the other gains that you can get by having a greater understanding of how to exercise politics in a, in a much more sort of nuanced way. As I said at the beginning, China has come to the top table probably 10 years ahead of what its leaders thought was going to be the case. And this is because of the implosion in the West following Lehman Brothers. So the Chinese leadership, it's new. They've got a lot of, they've got a lot of catching up, a lot of learning to do. So I do feel for them because they're having to deal with, a, with an economy that domestically is at a crossroads and an international environment that actually is very complicated and getting more complicated by the day which is why the soft power thing is, is absolutely vital, in my view, for China to really cement its position as number one. I have a question over there. Uh, just dovetailing really on the previous two questions, I think we talk a lot about the relationship between China and the US, but what's happening with Europe? Uh, you almost written off Europe in your presentation saying nothing important is going to uh, happen there, but, you know, and I feel a little bit the same way. I think when European policymakers think about China, they are mostly frozen with fear and don't know what to do. But what would be a solution? What do you see as a possible solution uh, for this relationship? Uh, where are you from before I say anything? I'm from Hungary, but I live here Hungary, in China. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> fine, that's fine. Um, well, I'm British, so uh, I was a bit um, uh, cavalier with my comments on Europe because I'm, I'm British and that's... Yes, so there you go. Um, I, I agree, so... <laughs> <laughs> well. The point is, uh, you'll notice that I caveated it with the idea that this is a real shame for the global economy, because I think the, the I said the Eurozone, but I actually mean the EU, is actually the champion of rules-based approach to running the economy. And this is really important, and China and the rest of the world could really learn things, I think, from what the, how the EU, in some respects, approaches policy. My concern is that, however, the EU is becoming the Eurozone, and the Eurozone we think it's going to survive. It may, it, you know, 20% chance of collapse, I think it is now in our forecast, that all the, all the efforts will be concentrated on keeping this show on the road. And they're having to think about banking union, fiscal union, all sorts of things they never had to think about before. And that does mean that policymakers' uh, energy will be going into just keeping the Eurozone on the road. I think you're absolutely right with the sort of rabbit in headlights, uh, scared of China thing. I think they don't understand China. And I think there's a bit of sort of mutual misunderstanding as well. Uh, but, you know, Europe, I think, is, is, is not going to be where it needs to be in the next sort of decade two, or two decades or however, however long it takes to, to really solve the problems within the Eurozone. And the US, of course, well, they're much stronger in terms of their, eco of their economy. But the politics are so deadlocked that you'd, even Obama was re-elected, but he hasn't done anything, and he won't be able to do anything for the rest of his term, as far as I can see. And then 10 years from now, the US will be looking at its own fiscal issues, which will start to kick in. So really, this is such a the window of opportunity for China to set, to set the agenda is just enormous, but it won't be open forever. I'd say 10 years, 15 years, it will start to close again, and things will realign. So a great opportunity for China to start to set the agenda. Um, 
A simple question. Do you think corruption and uh, income inequality will derail China's rise? Well, you've put your finger on one of the things we are concerned about, and this sort of inequality thing. It's not just in China, of course. It's also in Europe, even. Uh, it's in Latin America. I mean, everywhere. Um, the Chinese government is looking at this. I was impressed, if that's the right word, by the latest five-year plan in the sense that the Chinese government is trying to bring more people into the growth story, social housing, and so on. This could be the, this coupled with corruption, the anger at corruption, and this actually more than, in many countries, more than the desire for democracy, it's anger at corruption that brings down governments. So this is a real, these two things you hit on are absolutely key, I think, for, for, de for stability uh, in China going forward. The encouraging thing, of course, is that the government is recognizing this, and Xi Jinping is making efforts to, to, to try to sort of send out the right noises, but of course the effectiveness dealing with this uh, down the chain uh, is, is, you know, who knows, but no, two absolute key things that our team is following in its political forecast for China.